today from John chapter 20 verses 19 to 31 as Jesus appears to his disciples on the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews Jesus came and stood among them and said peace be with you and after he said this he showed them his hands and his side the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And not Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But those are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Here endeth the reading for today. So in our scripture for today, we find Jesus appearing to the disciples after his resurrection. Now at first, when he appears to them, Thomas is not with them. We do not know why Thomas was not with them, but he simply was not there the first time. We do know that from the scripture, the way that it is written, the other ten were gathered. Now if you're wondering if my math is off, quickly you will notice that 10 plus 1 is 11 and not 12. Well, remember the 12th disciple was Judas, and he is no longer in the picture. So Jesus appears to the 10 and shows them his wounds that he suffered on the cross. And the other 10 tell Thomas all about it when he comes. And Thomas does not believe what they have told him. And in doing so, he earns for himself the moniker that will stick with him for the rest of time, doubting Thomas. And when Jesus does appear to them again, Thomas is with them this time. He tells Thomas to touch his wounds. Knowing that Thomas had said, unless I can touch his wounds, I will not believe that he has risen. And after doing so, Thomas does believe that Christ is risen. Jesus closes this interaction by saying to Thomas, you believe because you have seen. But I tell you, the ones that believe without seeing are blessed. Now, if you have been blessed to grow up in a family that has gone to church, then chances are you have heard this scripture more than once in your life. You may have even heard people referred to as a doubting Thomas. And often this scripture is used as a way of questioning someone's faith. See, when there is a person who doesn't want to believe deeply in the Lord, they get called a doubting Thomas. When there is someone that says, I need more proof before I can accept what you were telling me, they get called a doubting Thomas. And when someone doesn't want to go along with what the rest of the church is saying, they get called, you guessed it, a doubting Thomas. 
Now, I'm guessing by now, if you've sat through my sermons in the past, you know that I generally do not like to use Scripture as a way to make you feel bad about yourself. See, there's plenty in the world already that's doing that for you. You don't need me to add on to it. Now, do not be mistaken. I will use Scripture to correct our course when needed, and I do so in my own life, and I pray that you do as well. But today, I want to talk about doubt and why it may not always be a bad thing, and how we can overcome doubt that people may have. See, we in the church, we almost always look at doubt and think that it is a bad thing. But doubt can be a double-edged sword. It can cut for good and it can cut for bad. What do I mean? Well, I want you to think about the good that doubt can bring. You see, we hear things in our lives all day long that are too good to be true. Our natural inclination is to doubt. Well, for most of us, it is to doubt those things. Buy this new shampoo and your hair will magically grow back in. It doesn't work. Invest now in this company and your money will triple before the end of the week. It probably won't. This car is perfect, never mind that it was in a wreck and the frame has been put back together with JB Weld. I promise you it's going to hold as you go down the highway. It's probably not going to. You see, doubt, a healthy amount of doubt can be a good thing. But when we doubt too much, it can be bad as well. When people that doubt a lot, they do so because of the experiences that they've had in their lives. And when someone is full of doubt, and there are people that seem to doubt everything that they are told, we call them a skeptic. Now, a skeptic is not going to do something just because you tell them to do it. A skeptic is going to believe, is not going to believe just because you believe. They are going to see proof, going to need to see proof in order to believe. Often they look at the negative and weigh that more heavily against the positives as well. For example, there are skeptics that refuse to believe in Jesus because of his followers. They look at all the bad things that Christians have done over the years. Oh, perhaps they were cheated in business by a professing Christian at one point in their lives. Maybe they tried to go into a church, but they were rejected for some reason. Maybe they point to the history of abuse that people have suffered at the hands of members of the church. See, they will look at these things and say, if that is what being a Christian is, I want no part of it. Now, what they do not look at or what they do not weigh as heavily on their scales is the good that has been done. They do not consider the missions that are funded and worked. They do not consider the people that are helped. And they do not think about the kindness of the ones that did treat them well. Now, this kind of doubt, it can be bad. And it is also a tool that Satan can use to push people away. So the question becomes, how do we overcome such doubt? Well, we do so by living our lives in accordance with the teachings of Christ. We do so by showing the skeptic that they are loved by us and by him, despite the fact that they may have been rejected in the past. We do so by showing them that we are trying to make this world better in the name of Jesus. John Wesley was uh, fond of saying, show others Christ. Show others Christ. And if that fails, tell them about Christ. But show them first. You see, when someone is a skeptic, they have to have proof. They have to see for themselves. And so we do all that we can, and there's one other thing that we need to do to overcome the doubts of a skeptic. You see, we have to be willing to admit that we are not perfect. Oh yeah, I know that one can be hard. You see, when someone who doubts in that way, the thing that they despise most in this world is a hypocrite. 
Well, brothers and sisters, we might as well get this out of the way. Hi, my name is Eric, and I am a hypocrite. You see, I do my best to live by Christ's teachings, but I fail. I am human, and so are you. One of the best videos I've ever seen in the church had a man saying that he would never go to church because it's full of hypocrites. It cuts to another man, and he says, Yep, you're right, and there's always room for one more. See, we have to show skeptics that we are not perfect, but Christ's love for them is perfect. Now, perhaps you've had doubt in your own walk with Christ. Maybe you've come week after week to church and you still feel that you struggle to believe. I want you to know this. That doesn't make you less than anyone else in God's eyes. Indeed, if you're honest with yourself, you can probably find times in your life when doubt has crept in. And if you're saying, saying no, pastor, not me, never. Look a little harder and understand that it is okay. You see, if Thomas, a man that walked right beside Jesus, a man that saw the great miracles that he had performed, can have doubts, then it's possible that us that live in the present can also struggle with doubt. Now, you need to know that Jesus doesn't reject Thomas because he had trouble believing. He didn't tell Thomas, be gone, you doubter. He didn't cast him aside because he was struggling. He did what needed to be done in order for Thomas to believe and be blessed as well. You see, he tells us, blessed are those who believe without seeing. But he doesn't say that you are never blessed because you struggled to see. Now, as far as Thomas struggling with doubt, I think it is important for us to think about what he had been through in the past few weeks. See, Thomas had seen the person that he believed to be the Messiah put to death. Take away that fact and look at it very simply. He had seen one person, a person that he had called a friend, betray his other friend to the authorities and turn him over to be killed. Do we get a better understanding of the mind frame that perhaps Thomas was in at the time? Does it seem like doubt now or does it seem like he was afraid? Afraid to believe again and afraid of losing so much again. You see, doubt takes on different forms in our lives. It is not just an unwillingness for us to believe or a stance that is being taken because we're stubborn. Sometimes doubt comes because we've been hurt so badly in the past. And sometimes doubt comes because we can't see the good because of all the bad we've experienced. But you need to know that Jesus moves closer to us when we struggle with doubt, just like he did with Thomas. You need to touch my wounds, Thomas. Well, here, touch them. For us today, we could hear Christ say, you need to see me in this world to believe? Well, look around. Yes, there are bad things in the world. But if you look at the good, then you can see Jesus in those good things. Yes, there are bad people in the world. But if you look at the good people and what they are doing, a lot of the times you will see Jesus in their lives. You see, God is still active today. In my own life, I can tell you the times when I have had doubts. It wasn't because God moved away from me. It was because I moved away from God. You see, his love is constant. Our love is fickle. And perhaps that is where you have found your doubt as well. Now, what about Thomas? Well, after his meeting with Christ, he does indeed believe again. And he goes all the way to India in order to spread the gospel. I want you to think about that. The one who doubted, the one that we have called Doubting Thomas throughout history, traveled further than any other of the disciples to tell the story of Christ. So today, I want you to consider yourself as Thomas. Think about how you may have had doubts in your walk. 
Know that his love, that Christ's love for you is an ever constant. And that he is always seeking ways to reach out and strengthen your faith. Then go and spread the gospel just like Thomas did. I'll leave you with this thought this week. What is the purpose of our belief? Why do we hold it over the doubt that can be so strong in our lives? Well, we are told at the end of the scripture today, we are told about all these things that Jesus did so that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, we may have life in his name. My challenge for you this week is this. I challenge you to be the reason that someone believes this week and not the reason that they doubt. Amen.